That, that sets uh, Tarantino apart from, I guess, most other directors is that he has managed to sort of, you know, revive whole new musical genres from his picks of music, like surf music as the obvious example of that. Uh, how conscious is he about that when he does it? I mean, is it just picking music he likes, or is it, I mean... Everything he does is well thought out. I mean, he's kind of a genius, I have to say. I mean, he's awesome to work with. He's a great friend, and he's good. Um, he's uh, inspiring. 
Um, so everything that he picks has a very specific reason for it. Um, that's not to say that he's stuck on something. If we can't, you know, if something doesn't work out, then we end up, you know, making a right turn and finding something even cooler. Um, uh, what was it? Seven Notes in Black. Ariza wanted to do Ode to um, Oranishii uh, over a piece by uh, Zamfir, the master of pan flute. Um, and we couldn't get the, we couldn't find him, first of all. He's elusive. Um, so, and we had no time. So um, we just took a right turn and used uh, Seven Notes in Black, which turned out super cool. And, and the track just sounded more menacing and, and interesting because of it. Um, so there's often, you know, ways that we'll back that up. But everything, uh, it, it, if something's in his films, it usually has some meaning for him, some uh, uh, background reference, something that, you know, he wants to um, uh, point up where it came from. You know, he wants his audiences to enjoy films as much as he does. And uh, so he's kind of like a film historian. And um, it's, they're, sometimes they're not overt. Sometimes they're, you know, little Easter egg, kind of hidden things that you have to, like, research and, and, and then go, that's why Leonardo DiCaprio was shot in the, the flower, because that references this other movie. So anyways, there, everything is layered with some kind of meaning. So, um, then my job is to, if there are holes, if there are in his palette, uh, then I help fill those in based on what he's uh, come up with. And a lot of my job with Quentin is being um, uh, support and being a detective, basically, and trying to find some of these obscure pieces of music. It's um, it's not easy uh, when he has Find in terms of rights clearing and so rights on. clearance. Yes, I'm uh, I'm a full service music supervisor, so everything I work on, I clear my own music. I'm kind of a control freak that way. I don't like to suggest music that and then hand it off to someone else to clear and then hear back weeks later that we couldn't get the rights to it because it was too expensive or something like that. I want to be in control of what I, I, I give to a director because I want to be able to deliver. Um, so, what, for instance, Quentin will hand me some obscure like thing. He'll make a homemade videotape of a Japanese television show from the 70s and say, yeah, this piece right here, this little tiny background piece right here, I want to try and use that. Um, <coughs> and there's no credits on it because he made it himself and there's no title. And this was back, I mean, we've been working since, you know, the mid-90s, so uh, Google wasn't around, I mean, iTunes wasn't around. There's a lot of things that I had to find the old-fashioned way, so um, I hire a lot of translators. Kill Bill Volume 1 was like a masterpiece <laughs> for him and for me, um, because a lot of the um, things were really obscure and worldwide, and it, you know, I had to hire Japanese translators, French translators, um, you know, and be on call 24 7 Japanese. Uh, I mean, uh, I was doing business in Italy and in Japan, and so I was pretty much up 24 hours during that movie uh, and nine months pregnant. So, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, as a matter of fact, one time we had just hours before um, business day closed in France, and I needed something, and I don't speak French, unfortunately. I, <laughs> I looked out, I worked out of my house that day, and I looked out my front window and I saw um, my neighbor, who I remember was from Montreal, so she had to speak French. So I, she was out gardening, gardening in her front yard, um, minding her own business, and I went and grabbed her, and brought her over to my house, and like wrote something down for her to translate, and um, made the call within minutes before France shut down for all of June or something. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> right? I'm looking French, that's awesome. So uh, there's been a lot of situations like that. A lot of things that were that required um, fancy footwork on my part. But at what stage are you involved in the process? I mean, when do you start go to work as far oh, as music production? Way, way, way pre-production. With Quentin, especially, <coughs> way, way pre-production. Um, uh, before even the crew is hired, um, we'll get together and talk because it's Music is so important to his films, and so important. It's, it's a character for him, so um, it's one of the first things we sit down and talk about um, when he's got a That's project. unusual, isn't it, compared to other directors? Yes. Yeah, and other yes. projects. Um, other directors, unless it's a musical or an animated feature or something, um, you don't meet until post-production, usually. So you come on a post-production, and there's something to see up on screen that you can work with, which is always better. Whatever you think 
is going to go in, you know, from reading the script, whatever you think musically could work, nine times out of ten, you just card those ideas once you see what the director has shot, because it's really the visual cadence that you're, you're uh, working with. Um, so it's, you know, uh, and every director has their own style, their own um, pauses, their own beats, so it's, it's, it's important to see what they've created visually and then you work them that way. Um, some of the some of the things that uh, I do, it's did, did you want to um, working with Quentin. Sometimes you'd think that um, it's really easy to get music for his movies. It's not. Um, like everyone should know who he is and want their music to be used. It's not that easy. Um, for instance, uh, there will be a woman soon. That's a Neil Diamond song, and um, he initially denied the use. Um, because he didn't like the fact that there were drugs in the scene, and uh, he didn't like the action in the scene. Um, and so I wrote him a letter, uh, and talked about how it in no way glorifies the use of drugs. I mean, she almost dies. She almost ODs from her folly. And the funny thing is, he gave us the song, but um, he also, years later when I met him, and I mentioned that scene, he quoted me back to me. <laughs> he wanted my letter back to me, and he didn't realize it was... Uh, me that wrote the, written the letter, but that's a pretty funny moment. Um, so there's been moments like that that are iconic that wouldn't have happened had it not been for just perseverance, passion, you know, not giving up and, and not taking no for an answer. A lot of times when you go to clear a piece of music, you know, because it's the bureau bureaucracy is too difficult, ah, uh, there's, you know, Leroy Gomez and Santa Esmeralda were having difficulties with their label, so they just initially denied um, the use of Please Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, that, that flamenco piece that's so amazing. Um, and I couldn't take no for an answer, so I, um, I started researching Leroy Gomez, tried to find him. I knew his last known address was in Massachusetts, so I called every Gomez in, in the phone book. <laughs> Found his mother on probably 21 or 22 Gomez, and she told me he lives in France now and gave me his cell phone number. I called him, got him to make some sort of agreement with his record label, make up. They've been boring for years. <laughs> Make up so that we can get this done, and it worked out. So um, a lot of times, it's it's better uh, when you hear no from like a Universal Records or you know a publisher. It's always good to go the extra step and and do a little more research on your own. The good thing you're involved at an early stage. So. Yes, as a matter of fact, <laughs> it is. Um, is there anybody in here who wouldn't like their track to be on a Tarantino movie? Yeah. No. Everybody wants it. So if you want to track on a Tarantino movie, how do you go about that? Get it to me. Um, you know, he doesn't normally use uh, new music, except for this last movie, Django Unchained. We had some really great new songs written for the film that uh, that was a first for him, and it was, it was they elevated the movie so beautifully. Um, another thing I'll say is, um, when I get it to him, um, I'm going to suggest you put it on a cassette tape. That's what I had to tell John Legend uh, uh, and Frank Ocean. I, mean, I, I said, you know, this is great. This digital link is all cool and everything, but um, you're going to have to put this on a cassette tape. And hand write the title and hand write him a letter and send it to this address. So um, that's really the way you get his attention. He's not a digital guy. He's not even a CD guy. He's more of a, you know, analog type of person. Um, he loves, I mean, you know the kind of music he loves. If you think you have a, a, your finger on what he likes, do something like that. Um, do a cover of something you think he might do. Those are good ways to get his attention. Get, I mean, and so then maybe we'll see. Um, it's a long shot, but who knows? <laughs> uh, and that's a good good thing in general. Anyways, is um, one thing I tell new artists is. Music supervisors really pay attention to covers. Um, if you want to get noticed, um, it's a good idea to pick a song that's a famous song, not like a rock, and not a not a crazy hard one to clear, not a Rolling Stones song or something, you know, Led Zeppelin. Find something that is, you know, pretty uh, one-stop publishing, um, and do a cool cover of it, and put it up on YouTube or, you know, post it somewhere. Um, it will get noticed if it's good, and that helps us to link into your band, into your music. It sounds lame, I know, um, but it's sort of like when you're fishing, you know, you throw this out, listen to this, and then listen to what else I can do. Um, you know, Dixie Chicken, it's a great song, one of Quentin's favorites. 
Um, <laughs> um, but you know, stuff like that is a, it's a really good way to get um, to get your music noticed by music supervisors. We're always ads, trailers, um, big montage scenes. It's often better because the kind of music we're looking for is stuff that's going to um, not take the listener's ear away from the dialogue, away from the scene, the moment. Um, so a lot of times it is easier for us to use well-known songs because the listener, the audience can hear it and, and kind of discard it and let it go in the background and let the, the dialogue come to the forefront. You don't want to have an exposition scene with a brand new Crystal Method song playing in the background. You just, it's not, um, it, you could, but it's, um, it's kind of difficult to pay attention to the action. Despite the fact that, that he doesn't want to use uh, so much uh, uh, new music. Um, as you were saying now, it sort of started with John Legend and so on and so forth. Um, so that is, is a change of direction on the side, right? Yeah, we were lucky on this movie. Well, this movie spoke to a lot of people. It spoke to the musical community. It was a very special movie, and the, the story spoke to a lot of people. Um, and as a matter of fact, a lot of the songs were written based on the log line of the, the story. Um, there's nothing Nothing cooler than writing a revenge song or a love song, um, you know, that you know somebody's going to get shot. Um, you know, so it was inspirational for a lot of people. Anthony Hamilton and Elena Boynton wrote a gorgeous song called Freedom that um, Quentin used beautifully in the film uh, when Django and Grumhilda are escaping and she gets caught. And it's just, um, as a matter of fact, that was one of the first uh, new songs that listen to and um, and agreed to use and that was the door opener for the rest of them. Um, John Legend's song is used in a clinical moment. There's a little bit of it there. Um, Kick-ass revenge song and a love song. It's just gorgeous. And he used um, a sample by um, the mighty Hannibal who just passed away. Gorgeous guy. Um, anyways, um, and Yomar Coney wrote a new song with Elisa, uh, which is a gorgeous moment in the film. Quentin didn't even know, I don't really know, what the lyrics were because they're in Italian. But the lyrics are, um, you know, I've missed you and I'm here again, kind of a thing. And he used it where uh, uh, Django gets to see Brunhilde again. It's gorgeous and beautiful and serendipitous. 